welcome, welcome, welcome. Is this not a day to rejoice in the Lord and to be glad in this day? Now, I know for some it is hard to do that today because of catastrophes and trials that have come your way. But this is the day the Lord has made. It may not be the day that you created for yourself, but this day He has created for you and He has created for me. And all things work together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purposes, not our own, but His purposes. And this is a day to rejoice Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but spring is a crazy busy time. For the ministry, it's very busy. And I sat down with the Lord and sort of, I've been taking a couple days off this week because it's been so crazy in the office and crazy in the ministry. I needed a breath of the heavenlies, a breath of the holies with my father. And so I took a couple days off. And as I did that, I kept on hearing this phrase, a rested development. Now we've heard of arrested, A-R-R-E-S-T-E-D, arrested development. But this is A, a capital A, and the word rested, a rested development. And the Lord has developed in me this sense of an urgency to rest. Really an urgency, yes, that's what he's put into me, to share with you that there is an urgency for us to rest. I'm afraid many of us are being burnt out, burnt out on our jobs, serving in the churches, taking kids to games, going to concerts, uh, mowing the grass, tending to the garden. It is a crazy busy time in this world. But the Lord has given us this beautiful understanding and importance about resting. And I want to share that with you today. A rested development. I'm going to go back to Ecclesiastes. Now, Ecclesiastes is a wonderful book. It was written by Solomon. Now, if you know anything about Solomon, he wrote three books in the Bible. He wrote Song of Solomon, and he wrote that in the, in his early life. It's full of love and romance and ideas about loving and being loved. And it's a beautiful love story kind of book. And then he wrote Proverbs in his middle years, in his maturing years. God gave him these Proverbs. And then toward the end of his life, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes that we're going to read from today. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, he is looking back at his life and he is, he is sort of rehearsing everything that his life has meant. And he comes up with some amazing truths. And one of those truths is found in chapter 4, verse 6 of the book of Ecclesiastes. It says this, Better a handful of rest than both hands full together with toil and labor and grasping and striving after the wind. Better is one hand of quietness and rest than two hands full of busyness all the time. Now you have to remember that when God gave Solomon the book, the, the wisdom, this is God's very own wisdom spoken through one man, Solomon, the wisest man who has ever lived on this side of eternity. And so because it is so much God's wisdom through Solomon, it's important us for, to understand and take note that when he says, better God, this is God speaking through Solomon, when God says, better is one hand resting than both hands constantly at work and striving after the wind, we need to pause a moment, meditate, and contemplate that verse. The f- Solomon talks about the futility of life in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the sad and simple message of that book. And it it pictures several things. In chapter 4, it's pictured as a man who is a skilled worker who becomes a workaholic who works completely to one aim, forsaking everything else in his life. Where chapter 5 is the exact opposite or antithesis of that. And it pictures a foolish man who doesn't work at all. 
Chapter 4, one who works too much. Chapter 5, one who doesn't work. And what Solomon is trying to show us is that there is a, a tender and fragile balance between working and not working or striving and laboring and resting in quietness. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now you may think, oh, I've heard about rest. I've heard about that I'm supposed to rest. I'm telling you, God has changed me these last couple days as I've been resting in Him. And then as I did this study today, He opened up something that I really had not pursued in the Scriptures. So with an open mind and an open heart and open ears, I want you to receive the Word of the Lord for you today. There are times when we are at rest physically but our mind races a million miles an hour. There are some times when my spirit is at peace, but my flesh finds another mad dash to jump onto and to run with. And so, do we really ever rest? It's doubtful. But the Lord is very concerned about rest. After all, He rested after six days of labor. I know it's a Sunday school lesson that on the seventh day God rested. And I mean Sunday school lesson. I mean we have learned this and been taught this our whole Christian lives. That God rested on the seventh day. But do you understand what God is demonstrating for us? There is a time to work and there's a time to rest. Now God needed no rest. Because he's God. He's omnipotent. His power is endless. His might is, is on forever and ever. But he was showing us a pattern and demonstrating to us that there are seasons and cycles in our lives. And resting is part of the cycle and part of the season of what he has called us to do. To rest in him. Genesis 2.2. Let me read it just because I want to set the foundation. And on the seventh day, God created, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work he had done. He rested from all of his work. But it's not just our bodies that God wants us to find some rest. God opened up three scripture, scriptures that are so enlightening uh, it just kind of uh, surprised me, really, when I put it together, when God put it together for me, how uh, important and crucial rest is. We need rest for the body. 2 Corinthians 7, 5 says this, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. This is Paul talking. And he talks about the need that when he came to Macedonia, his body had no rest. What he was really crying out is, I am so weary. My body is so tired. It had no rest. We understand the body needs rest. But how about your soul? Now, the soul part of you is the emotional part of you, the way you think and reason, the way you feel, the way you act, what you say. That's all part of your soul. And God says there's a rest that is needed for your emotions and for your thinking. And that's really hard for us to do in today's society because if our bodies might be resting on the couch, but our minds are plugged into cell phones and computers and tablets or TV or radio. And so there's no rest for our thinking, for our minds, and no rest for our souls. But listen to what the scripture says. This is Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. Come to me. This is, this is a, a, a very well-known verse. Come to me, Jesus says. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, normally we stop there. But listen to what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus wants us to come to him, not just bodily, but he wants us to come to him if we're laboring and heavily laden, that we might find rest for our souls, rest for our emotions, rest for our minds, rest for the things we do and say. Oh, how I long to find that kind of rest for my soul. 
but not just rest for the body and not just rest for the soul, but there's also a rest for our spirit man. Now, the spirit part of us is the part that communes and fellowships directly with God. It's the place where he communicates to us. It's the place that he speaks to us, where we speak out of, where we are in perfect fellowship and intimacy through our spirits. This is 2 Corinthians 2.13. This is Paul again. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother but taking my leave of them I departed for Macedonia Paul talks about a rest in his spirit a place deep inside him that the place where God dwells that there is a rest for that as well so we have a rest for our bodies a rest for our souls and a rest for our spirits That's powerful, that God is concerned and patterning himself, not just when he said, I rested on the seventh day from all my labors. What he said was, I'm resting to demonstrate to you that there is an important facet of resting in him, not just bodily, but resting our minds and resting our spirits, resting our emotions. How many of us need to find a place of rest for those emotions of ours? Those emotions that drive us, those passions that lead us into places and cause us to run headlong into things. We need to find a place of rest for our souls. True rest is a divine cessation or ceasing from motion and emotion, from motion and emotion. That kind of rest can only come from him. Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. You see, it's it's a gift. Rest is not something that I can concoct on my own. Rest is not something that I can create. I can sleep. I can take a nap. I could go sit on the beach. But understand that the true divine rest that God is speaking about in his scriptures can only come from him as a gift. We have to come to him him and ask him and say, God, I need that divine rest in my body, in my soul, and in my spirit. Only then can we reach that place where everything ceases and I center myself in the fullness of his rest. It is a gift of God. We try and strive. We go, okay, I'm going to take a 15-minute power nap. Well, that helps regenerate our body for 15 minutes, but it doesn't give us rest. What that does is gives us the ability to do something else. That's not what rest is. Rest is not this principle that if I rest, I can do more. If I sleep well, I can get more done tomorrow. If I go to bed early, I'll have a better handle on my emotions. If I just go to bed now and sleep it off, I'll wake up tomorrow morning in the faithfulness of his new mercies and I can do more things. That is not rest. Rest is ceasing, not striving to do more. And that, I think, is where we get our mistake, that we think that if we just take a moment to be with God or take a moment to rest, that we're doing what God has asked us to do, and it's not true. Rest does not mean get ready to do more. Let me show you. David tells us to, in Psalm 37, verse 7, to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Now, I looked up the word rest in that scripture, and it means this, to be dumbfounded. Is that not the craziest definition of what rest means, is to be dumbfounded? But that's the, I went to three different um, uh, Hebrew um, dictionaries and concordances and looked it up, and all three said the same thing. The very first word was dumbfounded, that to be in, to, to rest, so this is what it says, Be dumbfounded in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, what in the world does that mean as a word picture to us to be dumbfounded? Well, I have a sense of an understanding. I don't understand it completely. But as God spoke it to me today, he said, when you are dumbfounded in me, when you just sit there in absolute awe of who he is, he said, it's in that moment that everything else in this world rests. 
when I am completely awestruck and dumbfounded being in his presence, when I find a stillness and a calmness and in awe of his wonder, of his majesty, of his beauty, of his peace, of his voice, when I am dumbfounded, I stop. I stop in wonder of it all. And everything else comes to a halt and sort of breaks off of me in his presence. It's much like when you go to the beach and you go year after year, but you only go one time. And that very first moment when you walk onto the, oh, to the beach or you hear it and you just stand there and you're in awe and you don't move and you just look and listen and feel and sense the salt water and the splashing and the mist and the birds calling, you're dumbfounded. And in that moment, you take a deep breath and you just feel it all melt away. That's what God says we can have every moment that we come to Him and rest and wait patiently for Him to dumbfound us. What a great definition. Now it has secondary applications of definitions, and it means this, to stop and be astounded. Isn't that much like dumbfounded? But it means to stop and to be astounded, to cease and to rest, to be silent. And then it says to keep silent, to be still, to tarry, and to wait. We can be silent, but really it's hard to keep silent because we want noise. We want something going on around us. And God says, if you want to be dumbfounded, cut the noise. Turn the world off. Come to me, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. Come to me, and I will give. It's a, a gift. It is something that he bestows upon us, that he bestows to us, and he operates through us. It is all from Him. The only place of true rest is in fellowship with God and in His presence. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Now I'm going to read it out of the New King James, but then I'm going to read it in the message so you understand. Because I had to go to the message. It's not because you don't understand. I had to go to the Message Bible to get a real, a real uh, sense of understanding about what God was trying to speak to me. This is Hebrews chapter 4, 10 and 11. For he who has entered, he us, for he who has entered his rest, capital H, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Be diligent to enter that rest. Now there are two implications. There's the eternal rest that we enter into. But there's also this temporal rest that we're living through right now. Now the message says it this way, God himself is at rest. I love that. God himself is at rest. And at the end of this journey, we will surely rest with God. So let's keep at it. Let's keep at what? At striving after him, but striving after resting. Let's keep at it and eventually arrive at the place of rest. Isn't that a beautiful picture? God is at rest, and he wants us to be at rest. Rest is from the Father. It's accomplished through the Son, but it is achieved and executed by his Spirit. The Trinity is involved, and any time the Trinity is involved with any aspect of our walk, I, I, I mean, they're all involved, but I mean, when they, we can see it in the Scripture and see it in the Word, that the three the members of the Godhead, the Trinity in the fullness, God in the fullness, operates to give us rest. We really need to take note. So let me show you. Um, in Isaiah 63, 14, now we know that uh, God says in Ecclesiastes 4, 6, Better is a handful of quietness and rest than full of labor and toil. And we understand that God rested in Genesis 2, 2. We know the, that God is, the, is, is from the Father. The rest is from the Father. Rest comes from Him. But Jesus came to this earth to give us a conduit, a vessel, a mediator between God and man. And in that mediation, Jesus says, You come to me, and I'll give you the rest from my Father. 
If you are heavily laden and laboring, you come to me and I will give you the rest that my father promised you. But it's executed through the Holy Spirit who lives within you. This is a great verse out of Isaiah chapter 63, verse 14. And again, I'm reading it in the message to give us a broad understanding of it. Like a herd, like a herd of cattle led to a pasture. You know, cattle are led to a pasture for a sweet time of refreshing, to be fed, to rest. And God says, like a herd of cattle led to pasture, the Spirit of God gave the people rest. You see, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And because of that, Jesus gives us the rest from the Father through Jesus, but given to us by the presence of the Holy Spirit. You cannot find divine rest without the Holy Spirit, without knowing Jesus, without coming to the Father through Jesus Christ. Without that, there can be no true rest on this earth. And I guarantee you that if you are not saved by the blood of the Lamb, if you do not confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, you will never find eternal rest because you will only find eternal torment absent the presence of God in a place of judgment that the Bible calls hell. Salvation brings rest, both here and eternally. Always will God give us rest. You know, I'm a musician. I spent most of my life playing the piano and teaching piano and leading worship, and I, I, I play different instruments. And so when I was talking, uh, talking to the Lord about rest, He reminded me about the music. Because in music there are notes of alternate durations, two counts, four counts, eight counts. But there are also rests in music. And the rests are not there to be slurred over. In other words, the rests are put in music to take a break from the melody. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. There, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You see, there's a break. There is a, a, a moment of breathing in between those notes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You see, rests are put in music not to be slurred over, and they're not to be completely omitted. They are not there to take away from the melody. Rests are put there to enhance the melody. Rests are put there to shine a light on the notes. Without the rests, music is just a cacophony of, of ongoing notes that never cease. It's note after note after note after note. We need those rests in music. For musicians, if you're playing a wind instrument, like I played most of my life as a, as a clarinetist, you need rests to go <gasps> and take a breath. Without that breath, you can't play the music. And God reminded me that my life and your life is just like that. We need times of rest, not to be slurred over, not to be omitted, but put there to enhance the rest of the music of our lives. We need a moment to breathe, to bring out that break in the music of our lives, to point to the rest of the melody. And then it will be beautiful and it will not just be this ceaseless, ongoing droning of note after note after note. If we look up to God himself, he will beat the time of our lives. He will tell us it is time to rest. It is time to go. It is time to rest. It is time to go. God wants to beat out the beautiful melody of your life, but he wants us to put in a rest. Every now and again, that true divine rest that only comes from Him. For me, that was a rested development for my life. He loves you. He loves you. And He wants to give you rest. If you need help finding that place, give us a call. Write to the ministry. Get online and leave us a prayer request. We are praying for you. And we want you to enjoy the music notes and the music rests of your life. 
He's painting a beautiful picture with your life, with his, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, In Moments Like These, Volume 2, by Jenny Pfister. Moments Like These, Volume 2, is available at Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.